first off it's super engaging and the illustrations are awesome thank the you the first thing i wanted to ask is how was the process of researching all of the different players and putting a book together cuz <laughs> It's not easy to like get all that information and do the research. How long did yeah. that take? Well, you know, this is my fourth book, but the first one that included illustrations. And I thought I was going to make it easier on myself, right? Like, all right, the illustrator is doing a lot of the work. Um, and she did. Sophia Chang did an amazing job. But once I started getting back into the history of the game, I realized that there's a lot of cool stories very few people have heard of. And so... I started, you know, and and it's not like you can just easily find these things. You know, there might have been one female historian who was like this matters. Yeah. And <laughs> like saved it. Um so it, it ended up being just tons and tons of research and then I started to feel more uh weight, I guess, to make sure I didn't miss any women from history that history had already missed. Yeah. Um so it was a ton of work and but I I of all of my books I feel like this is just this beautiful culmination of you know collaborations with people as well as like my love of the game and and hopefully it finds a place with basketball lovers because as you know it's not like selling the women's game has always been the easiest endeavor anyone undertook. <laughs> oh yeah and and I yeah. feel that I like how you introduce it with a a a, a woman who signed a multi-million dollar deal. That's right. And that's in the future <laughs> and So I'm thinking like what do you think technology is going to offer women and how they can expand their platforms and bring interest because it you know we can it's all about the story like I saw some of your TED talk it's about the story and if you can sell a yeah. story you can get viewers how do you think technology is going to help I think it already has I think you, a lot of the ways we can build platforms now has led to places like together and just women's sports and I'm sure I'm missing others where just the 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 cost of getting something off the ground to cover these games isn't a bazillion dollars like you don't just need the old legacy media to do this stuff and so i think you've seen instead of jumping through every single uh, hoop and like scrolling through ESPN to try to find the one article that lets you know about the upcoming storylines you can if you understand this stuff you can access these storylines easier already And I yeah. think that that's going to continue to help grow. I mean, we've already seen how it's grown the women's game. And we already we have these like key moments coming up whether it's the WNBA league rights being on the open market again for the oh. first for the first time in a long time and really having a moment where people I think will will pay for them. That's going to drive money back into the game. And so when we were when I was opening this book, and we had this comic book art and we were putting it at the 75th anniversary of the WNBA, I'm trying to imagine what the growth would be like if the trajectory we've seen over the last few years continues. Of course, the only model I have is what success looks like to NBA players, you know? So it's like yeah. I, I mean, do I think on a 100 million dollar contract for our future WNBA star is the definition of success? I guess because I have no other model, right? That's how they <laughs> that say is, that's what the business says. <laughs> that's, what, that's what success is and that's what people understand, so that's how we built it. Do I hope the WNBA has success and maybe does things a little differently? Sure, but I can't imagine that right at this moment because I don't know what that would look like. Yeah, no. I I think it's a really good vision because another thing I want to touch on is how they say that oh, well no, women's basketball isn't interesting to watch because they're not the they don't run as fast or they're not as interesting. And I wanted to think about what is your take on that because this week Iowa City has uh sold out all the games <laughs> and I'm like we are interesting we are interesting all it takes is some time and commitment so what do you think about that and why do people right. do stuff like that you know okay so here's like this is so specific i'm going i'm like flipping through my my hoop muses here you bring up iowa and yes so there's this small moment in the book it's under this like chapter called the moments and it tells the story of when iowa in 1925 tried to cancel the Iowa State girls basketball tournament. And this was at a Presbyterian church in Des Moines. They all gathered and they were like, we're no longer going to sponsor girls basketball because it's too strenuous. It's unseemly that women would play this game. Mm -hmm. And there was actually a couple men there. One of them his name was John Agins. He objected. And he actually has this quote. It's a direct quote that has survived history and he says 
gentlemen, if you attempt to do away with girls basketball in Iowa, you will be standing at the center of the track when the train runs over you. Okay. So one, if if a if a, a man had said that about like saving the NBA, he would have a statue and we would know his name and so but I'll tie this to your question in that when I now watch Caitlin Clark or Iowa, I think about why Iowa is ripe to have a player like that and to respond yeah. to a player like that in a very unique way because they have a history that goes back even before this moment. So the the state tournament never died. That guy yeah. started a separate one. And since that moment, Iowa has had state girls basketball tournaments that seven, eight thousand people have attended pretty much every year. So yeah. what do they have? They all agree in Iowa that not just men's basketball matters, but women's basketball matters because it's it's been part of their history for going on a hundred plus years. And so yeah. They know the storylines of players in their state. They know their lineage. They know the mythology of the game. And it leads to a moment where someone like Caitlin Clark, who truly is bringing the game forward, not only is amazing to watch, but people in Iowa don't need to be convinced that yeah. she matters and that it matters. And so it's moments like that where you say, like, does it matter that Caitlin Clark, her vertical may not be as high as Russell Westbrook's? It doesn't seem like it does to anybody there. And so that model could be replicated, but we've never, we've canceled girl, girls basketball in other areas or we haven't invested. And so we don't have that lineage of storytelling and, and stakes. And so that's something obviously that in Hoop Muses, in our own way, we're trying to build back some of that lineage and mythology of this game. Yeah. I just didn't know how many women were so impactful in the beginning of the sport, but you don't, you don't hear about it. You don't learn about it. So I guess yeah. the whole premise of the book is we should know our history because it does inform our now and our future as all of the cliches go. But I will say that I don't think it's not like, oh, kids these days don't know their history. It, I don't put the blame on the women who play this game now. I, I mostly am just sort of lamenting the fact that this history is not easily known in our culture. Like if if you grew up, if, if you grew up and you're a college player now, you're gonna probably know a lot of stories from the history of men's basketball. And oh. you're also probably gonna have, yeah, you're probably gonna have like a Steph Curry poster on your wall because one, that's all you see in here. And two, it's easy to get a Steph Curry poster. It has been much harder over the years to say, get an Asia Wilson poster or something like that. So do I wish that players today understood that throughout the history of this game, women have owned it. Like mm -hmm. women have on the West Coast in college, women were playing it before men's sports even got organized to play yeah. the game. I mean, they played the first college game in the West Coast before men even had a team a decade before men had a team. So <laughs> it's not. Yeah. So like all of that to be said, like, I don't blame the players of today. You have to seek this history out. But hopefully as the women's game game grows and investment goes, we start telling some of these stories throughout history, like the way that they have told the history of, of men's sports. Yeah, but there's also exam examples of women being successful because there was one team that you mentioned made more money or was brought in more interest than the male counterparts. And yeah. it was the beginning of before the WNBA was made. And yeah. that just show, even with soccer, like women can pull it in. So I just, I hope those things begin to change. A fun question. Okay. You like speakers, I heard. What are your top five speakers that you Oh, okay. Well, I and have what? a lot of, okay, so I guess right now my number one sneaker would be the Stewie from Puma. Obvious reasons that like I'm, I have so much respect for Puma for investing in creating this new iconic women's basketball shoe. Uh, I know Candace has one at Adidas. And then, I mean, when I was playing in college, I played in the Air Swoop. So it's really nice that there is this beautiful new design shoe that is so specific to Stewie. Um... I also have to give a shout out to the the Walt Frazier suede shoes, just because yeah. I'm a Knicks fan growing up and it was a huge, uh, we, my dad and I were huge fans of that. One of my favorite others, I have a lot of silhouettes of the Air Jordan 1, um, I mean, meaning a lot of color, color pathways. I just think it's the best sneaker to wear with a pair of jeans. It's not chunky, you know. Um, I'm getting specific here. If you have your, I want to know your holy grails as well. I also have a couple yeah. Nike Air Max, like the weather spoons that I love just because they're so fun and poppy. Uh, yeah. Okay, I think that was four. And then, I mean, 
Every time I wear my Travis Scott's with the pink laces, they just really, they go hard in person. My sister, Maria Taylor, she's always on the field and she'll like have a skirt and some sneakers on. So yep, I, yep. I, as the little sister, I'll take a couple of those shoes. So I always love, I like Pharrell's line. Like I love art, I love making art. So I love seeing yeah. the different things. And the human race line to me is super interesting. He's just very vivid, like pa patterns and stuff. So I love all of his shoes. So I'll, I'll wear those on any kind of day, even if I'm in sweats. At least my shoes will be popping, you know. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I'm not precious with my sneakers either. Like I know it's not cool, but like I wear them all the time. I yeah. I don't they don't live in a box. I'm like, listen, uh, you know, who knows what happens tomorrow. I'm wearing my I'm wearing my sneakers out. <laughs> In one of your chapters, you mentioned how seeing women's basketball player Jennifer Rosati on the cover of Sports Illustrated was inspiring for you. How did seeing this continue to influence your passion for basketball? Yeah, so it was it was um, that UConn team of 1995, yes. right? I was young enough, and this was before the Shemiko Holdsclaw undefeated Tennessee team of 97-98. I was a little older, and I loved Shemiko Holdsclaw and that team a lot, too. But, but when I was, I think I was like 13 or 14, when UConn went undefeated, so it was like, Rebecca Lobo, Nikisha Sales. We know, you know, hopefully people know that team. And Jen Rosati. And I, I remember when the, that Sports Illustrated landed and she was on the cover. I, I was just, I know it's such a cliche now, but I was like, oh my God, I play basketball. And she's on the cover of Sports Illustrated. It wasn't like I thought someday I could be on the cover of Sports Illustrated. It just had this cascading effect of, oh, I, I matter. Like this yeah. matters because it, the, at the time, Sports Illustrated was like the you know most expensive, most important real estate in sports media. And I remember reading that article too, and it was you know it was of course well written, and I there was just an all encompassing. Oh, I have a future somehow. Yeah. I don't know what it looks like, but this seems to me to be saying a future exists for me. I'm like flipping through it now. No, Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you're good. I'm flipping through it too. I also want to ask just as a graphic designer, what made you decide to include yeah. an illustrator and illustrations in it? Because this is awesome. Yeah, see that's yeah. the page. <laughs> um, well, you know, we both know this very well. Uh, you, you can't, I can't, I couldn't have written a history of women's basketball in black and white, mm -hmm. just text and thought I was going to be able to get it in people's hands in the same way. I think right from the outset, I wanted something that really reflected the joy and energy of the game that I experienced. Yeah. I mean, for me, when I was at ESPN, a lot of times when I was talking al aloud or asked to come on and talk about women's basketball or women's sports, something had happened, like somebody had disparaged it or mm. there was an example of inequity and I had to come on and speak about that. And it just puts you in this position of like, you, you have to come from an angle of, you know, bitterness or anger that like things aren't right. equal. And I was kind of tired of projecting this idea that women's sports was always bitter and angry because that's not the experience of actually being a female athlete. The experience of being a female athlete is like joy and yeah. vibrancy and humor. That's what I wanted to inject into the book. And I didn't think even as a writer, and I didn't think I could a picture, you know, a picture paints a thousand words kind of thing. I thought I needed color and illustration to make sure to get this book in people's hands. Especially in a world against where women players don't often get paid the same um, or mm -hmm. treated the same. But I, I have hope. I have hope for the future. Where do you hope yes. things go? <laughs> well, I, I definitely have hope. I feel like short term, I have a lot of hope that the WM, like speaking of basketball, like the WNBA, rights end up with somebody whether it's ESPN or, or not somebody somebody where they are committed alongside those league rights to build storytelling around it we we can't we can't have in the future just a WNBA game is like 7 to 9 p.m and there's no pre-game show and there's no post-game show and like there needs to be built-in infrastructure where people can understand who the athletes are so that's like the short term like three to five years where I feel like from a media perspective, I think things will start to shift. And then yeah. just, you see the investment. There's The W already has like, you know, two, at least two sort of billionaire owners who yeah. kind of, you know, just they have money where they can just do different things than previous WNBA owners. And so I think that that changes the game. It just like yanks everybody forward when somebody 
like the Liberty are like, oh, right, whatever, we'll eat $10 million. We're going right. to fly charter. It's mm -hmm. fine. We'll just eat it. It's no big deal. Um, that's the kind of money women's sports hasn't had. So um, it's not like, you know, billionaires are the answer to women's sports. But I think in the market that it's in, those two things to me signal like a healthy next for women's basketball. Yeah. And then another thing, they said that we couldn't dunk and that we wouldn't be able to do these physical things, but we are fully capable within our biology to be able to do different things, even if it's at a at our level. So yeah, I, I'm just wondering like how even medical technology can help us if we have the investment to get faster, to have more slam dunks, to have whatever is necessary to make it interesting because it, it's totally possible. No, I mean, I think... Um clearly the physical evolution of female athletes is we've seen it in this singular generation you've you know we have there's more women that can dunk the game is faster and quicker but i do think that the the men's game is evolving too so it, it's sort of like this catch-22 that we have where people have always said like oh we don't watch the WNBA because like no women can't dunk you know and then women started dunking and it was like well the dunks aren't as good and then if we started doing dunks that they deemed, you know, were great NBA dunks 20 years ago, then they'd be like, but you can't do that. It's like, it would be this moving goalpost because it's never been about dunking. It's always just been about the storylines and the way we talk about it and like the investment that people have emotionally and with their families and communities. Like that's why we love sports. And so do I want the game to keep evolving physically? Yes. But do I think that the people who hate women's basketball because they think it's not as physically evolved are going to change their minds? Probably not. They seem to dislike it for their own <laughs> inner reasons that they need to figure out. I think that's about all the questions I have currently. But I just wanted to say this is awesome. Like, this is awesome. Yeah. I just love every story here.